we will start. John Rudy, class of 2007, works as a park ranger and interpretive trainer at the National Park Service Stephen Mathers Training Center in Harpers Ferry, West Virginia. He creates training materials for park rangers and interpreters across the entire park system, breaking new ground in audience-centered experiences and facilitated dialogue for the National Park Service. He has been a leader in pushing the National Park Service to use new and innovative communication strategies to help visitors find deep meaning in park resources. In the history world, he studied radical dynamics in the aftermath of emancipation. John holds a master's degree in applied history from Shippensburg University and a bachelor's in history with a minor in Civil War era studies from Gettysburg College. So without further ado, I'm going to pass it off to John. He's going to present to us and then there will be some time at the end for question and answers. So John, it's your turn. Make sure I unmute myself so I'm not talking to myself. How's everybody doing out there? Uh, I'm John, like Monique said. Um, I try uh, I, I try to be real. <laughs> so um, I'm just going to talk to you about history. Um, I don't have a script that I read from, uh, I, but I'm I'm really at at my heart a storyteller, and I want to start by telling you a story that I have shared. <laughs> I was figuring this out this afternoon. Um, I have shared this story for at least 15 years, um, probably longer. And it's interesting. It's a, it's a weird story. It's an intriguing story. You probably heard this one. Um, the landscape you're looking at in this picture might look familiar. That is the campus of Pennsylvania College, now Gettysburg College, in 1863. And there's a building that you can't see in this picture. Um, I wish you could. This is a Matthew Brady picture. And there's uh, over there on the right-hand side is Pennsylvania Hall or the college edifice. In the center is the, the president's house, um, now the alumni house. And then over on the left-hand side is Linnaean Hall, the science and gymnasium building. But if you had uh, x-ray goggles and you could look straight through the president's house right now, you would see a fourth building of Pennsylvania College's campus. And in that building, uh, it, was a, it was a perk for the janitor of the college. He lived on campus and his name was Jack Hopkins. When the battle came to Gettysburg in 1863, Jack Hopkins and his wife, Julia, and his son, Edward Hopkins, weren't in that house. They had to run from the campus. They had to flee for their lives. Because in 1863, when the battle happened, Jack Hopkins, the janitor of Pennsylvania College, was African-American. And the Confederate armies that were pouring into Pennsylvania were snapping up black citizens left and right, grabbing folks as they crossed the border uh, and taking them back south to be sold into slavery. Um, one uh, officer called the, uh, the invasion of Pennsylvania uh, a giant slave raid as the black citizens of Southern Pennsylvania were, were being kidnapped. So the Hopkins family runs, they run away, they leave. They're not here to witness the battle that rages around the campus for three days. They come back and Jack Hopkins and his son Edward find that the place has been destroyed. Like all the dishes are broken. All the sheets have been torn up. There's a $5 mantle clock. And just to give you a sense, that's a third of Jack Hopkins' salary for the entire month. $5. He makes 15 bucks a month. $5. He's spending on the clock. That's, he's pretty well off, but it's been smashed. I used to tell that story and usually end it there. You know, that there was a, a black man on campus and that used to be enough for me. And as you have, you know, some of you are, are students here right now. Um, some of you are, are alumni or friends of the college. You've been to the campus, you've been to town. And a lot of the times that we share the stories of African-American participants in the battle, that's precisely how we share them. We share those stories and they are stories of passive observers, right? Jack Hopkins was here, the battle happened, he saw what happened. The thing is that I've come to realize that as we think about the history of this place, of this town, we have to stop thinking that way. We have to stop looking for passive observers. We have to look 
for active participants. And I know that that sounds weird, but when you start looking at the history and start digging into it hard, you can find active participants in the history, active members of the historical narrative everywhere, particularly in the African-American community. And oftentimes, and this is where I wanna to focus tonight, is that active participation looks like active resistance. When it comes to black history in Gettysburg, there's a long, long legacy. Resistance and speaking out. Speaking out against power, speaking out against privilege, just making sure your voice is heard. You know, I used to think that just being present in the narrative was enough. Like, just including a black voice or a black face was enough. And I've come to realize that it's not about just saying that, you know, black people existed in 1863, go figure. I think that there's an importance of cheering on the people of the past. Because when you cheer on the people of the past, when you go, that person was doing something right, they were doing something amazing. They were fighting for what they believed in and what was right, morally, legally, you're actually cheering on the people of the present too, right? You're saying the people that are still taking up this fight today, the legacy of the fight for civil rights are doing the right thing. So I wanna cheer on some of the people of the past, investigate how they came to this place. And I wanna start exactly where I started before, right there on the campus, right here on the campus of the college, because that Jack Hopkins story, that Hopkins family story is far more complex than I ever thought it was 15 years ago. That story is far more engaging and cooler. I didn't have a picture of Edward Hopkins, Jack's son, until a few years ago when I was looking through some files at the Adams County Historical Society up on the seminary campus and found this, just kind of on a whim. It's a stereo card, that, that's why there's two pictures. If you cross your eyes and you look at it weird, you can actually see this in 3D. It's from a, a, a trip on a fishing expedition in 1880 by the Sioux Fishing Club of Gettysburg. And this is, I believe this is, yeah, this is photo number nine. And that's the most important thing. This is a, a photo of Castle Hopkins. That's Castle Hopkins over on the right-hand side, the chef's tent or the cook's tent. And this right here, is the only known photo that I can find of Edward Hopkins, Jack Hopkins' son, the son of the janitor of Pennsylvania College at the time of the battle, and a veteran of the American Civil War. 1864, Jack Hopkins, or I'm sorry, his, his name is John Edward Hopkins, so sometimes I go Jack Jack. Edward Hopkins ends up joining the United States Colored Troops. He volunteers to fight against the powers of slavery in the South. And he joins, uh, he joins a unit that ends up in, at Fort Barrancas, Florida. And uh, there outside of Pensacola, he and his compatriots find joy every morning when they open up the gates of the fort. Because every morning they get to give formerly enslaved people who are escaping slavery their first free handshake. In 1880, same year this uh, photo was taken, Edward Hopkins realizes a dream. When the battle was happening here, he, he worked as a waiter in a local restaurant. And really that's his love. His love is running restaurants. And he's always wanted to run his own. And in 1880 in February, you see here, he got his wish. He opened an oyster saloon in McConaughey's Hall. Um, was kept before as a shipping office by Mr. Biddle. And he will furnish, as you see here, the best oysters to be had in the Baltimore markets, done up in every style. Just see, you know, oysters at this point in time, they're, they're like fast food. It's like, this is like running a hamburger stand today or a McDonald's. Um, it's gonna be popular among the folks that are here. He wants to run an oyster hall and now he's got it. But that's not the only thing that Ed Hopkins is doing in 1880. Because in that same uh, edition of the newspaper uh, is, uh, is this article. In Cumberland Township, adjoining Gettysburg, the Republican leaders had a colored brother placed upon their ticket for clerk. Now this is the local elections in Pennsylvania. And the clerk is the clerk of elections, the person that makes, the, uh, makes sure the elections are run fairly. 
It's an elected office at that point. Result, white Republicans refused to endorse the program and so eventually scratched as descended up to the wood, after the woodbine. But then check that next paragraph there. In the third ward of this borough, that would be Gettysburg, the Republican managers arranged the matter differently. They also placed a colored man and brother on their ticket, but took the precaution to put him where he could not be defeated for inspector. Many white Republicans objected and some put their protests in substantial shape, but the program went through, who claims the credit, don't all speak at once. Now, of course, this newspaper is a democratic newspaper. They're against the rising rights of African-Americans in the United States at that point in time. And so the fact that the Republicans put a black man on the ticket is anathema to them. It's, it's the worst thing in the world. And then check that next one. What capital slave drivers, drivers, the white and black Republican leaders in the third ward have made were not the former most responsible for the bulldozing, that means forcing people to vote away, practiced at the poll on Tuesday. The white Democrats of Gettysburg can't even fathom, they can't imagine that folks might want to vote for a black man. And so obviously there had to be some kind of nefarious tricks going on. Who was it that was on the ballot? Well, let's look at the returns. Now we're looking at the third ward here. We run down there, they said inspector. If you run down this list right here, I don't know if you can see my cursor or not. Right there you see Edward Hopkins. It's 91 votes for inspector against the Democratic candidate who gets 72. In the elections, the local elections of 1880, Edward Hopkins, son of Pennsylvania College's janitor, owner of an oyster house in Gettysburg, veteran of the American Civil War, becomes Gettysburg's first ever black elected official. What an outrageous thing intimidation is in the South. How about the operations of the colored committee in the third ward? Again, see this, the white establishment can't imagine. They can't imagine that a black man would garner votes from anyone. The Republican leaders in Cumberland Township had a colored man placed on the ticket for clerk, but when the day of election came, they showed the white feather by leaving him to flounder, a moral fear. You see this fear that exists in Gettysburg of a rising black middle class who is politically active. The cool thing about Edward Hopkins is that he's the first, but he's certainly not the last. In 1883, Isaac Carter, another veteran of the United States College Troops, this time of the 127th USCT, he runs for the same office for that inspector of the polls, and he gets it. In 1884, Ed Hopkins runs again. In 1885, Henry Reister runs. Then in 1886, William A. Thompson, who's a compatriot of Hopkins from the same unit, from the 25th USCT, he runs and gets it. Then in 1888, William Thompson gets it again. In 1889, George Disnick gets it. And then in 1890, Ed Hopkins is elected to the office again. It's a decade's worth of black political power that existed in Gettysburg. It's, it's homesteading, it's, 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 it's stepping into the wilderness, it's, it's being the first person to break that barrier. And the barrier was broken and, and you can see the floodgates open. Of course the floodgates eventually close too. Ed Hopkins is elected in 1890. He doesn't get a chance to serve again. Edward Hopkins died that year. Didn't end up in office. And a lot of the Hopkins legacy evaporated after that. But Ed Hopkins isn't the only one who's fighting for this right to representation, this right to be in the government and be part of the government and, and, and build a rising black middle class in Gettysburg. This is a really famous photo of the battlefield. There in the center, you see the, the man and woman there standing foremost. That is Basil Biggs on the left-hand side. Basil Biggs uh, came to prominence because uh, he buys this farm using the money he made from reburying the dead after the battle. They contracted Basil Biggs, and Basil Biggs contracts the, the local black community to rebury all of the United States soldiers who died during the Battle of Gettysburg. Here's an opportunity 
a man getting opportunity, a, a, a black man finding the right to rise literally from the bodies of the dead of the Civil War. And usually, again, that's where the story ends, right? It's where we stop paying attention. Basil Biggs did it, the battle's over, he reburies the dead, Lincoln comes and speaks, and then we forget that this man still exists, he still lives beyond that time. In 1870, the election 10 years before Edward Hopkins runs, this is the first moment that black men in Pennsylvania have been allowed to vote for nearly 40 years. In the 1830s, the state of Pennsylvania issued a new constitution, and that constitution explicitly barred black men from the right to vote. After the Civil War ended, of course, we have the constitutional amendments, but there's this, this gray period between 1865 and 1870 when there are states in the South where black men can vote, South Carolina. But yet still here in Pennsylvania in the, in the late 1860s, black men can't vote. This is uh, on the right-hand side here, you see a, a piece of testimony given by Otho Johnston. Otho Johnston lived at the Alms House, which was up on the north edge of town, just beyond the campus. It was the, the, the poor folks' home. It's a place where if you couldn't survive on what you made from your daily job, where you didn't have the, the way to support yourself, you could go there and, and live, live out your life. Otho Johnston lives there. He lives there with his son. His son's a, a mason. And between gigs, he can't afford to pay rent on a house. So he and his son both live there. Otho Johnston remembered afterwards, after that election day, that first election day when he was able to vote, exactly how it happened. See, what happened was the man who ran the Alms House, a Democrat, said, well, you know, I'm gonna pick up all the voters. He rides with a wagon filled with the voters from the Alms House down to the Cumberland Township polls, which were down where the, um, down just on the south edge of town by the cemetery. He rides up to the polls and working there at the polls, one of the folks there is Basil Biggs, that guy over there on the left-hand side in the picture. Basil Biggs is working there at the polls. He sees this wagon roll up with Mr. Johns whipping the horse and the only people in the wagon are white men. Now Biggs knows that out there at the farm, there's plenty of black men that live there like Otho Johnson, plenty of black men that now can write, have the right to vote. And he turns to another man there at the polls, a white man who was an ally of his, a man named David Hankey. Dave Hankey um, was a Pennsylvania college graduate. He turns to Dave Hankey and he says, listen, look what they're doing, look what they're doing. Dave Hankey gets angry. He knows jo jo uh, Jonas Johns. He, he walks up to him and he, he yells, where are the black voters? And Johns says, well, if you want them, go get them yourself. Dave Hankey, a few years before this, that during the, the Battle of Gettysburg, had really sacrificed a lot. There's this story in this book that's published afterwards. It's an oral history called Battleground Adventures. And in it is this story of the colored servant maid. We can't really figure out what her name was. I'm sorry, I don't have this woman's name, but she was a black woman who lived in Gettysburg at the time of the battle. She was a nanny for a local family, for a local widow and two children. And she lived out where the first day's battle happened, just down the street from Dave Hankey next farm over. And as the battle is breaking out, the widow realizes that the Confederates as they roll in are going to capture this woman that works for her. So they're trying to figure out safety. They're trying to figure out what to do. The Confederates are coming closer to the house. They run and they run to the next farm over, Dave Hankey. If Hankey's standing there in his kitchen watching the Confederates come towards his farm, and as they do, diving in through the door, comes the widow and the black woman. They dive in through the door. This 
black woman that was the maid and the, and the nanny for these children is cowering for her life in the basement behind the wood pile. And she begs Dave Hankey, don't let them get me. Don't let them take me. So Dave Hankey brokers a deal. As the Confederates were pouring in, there were wounded coming into the house. One of them was a Confederate officer. He's laying there on the table. Dave Hankey goes up to him and says, listen, listen, can I broker a deal with you? There's a black woman in my basement. There's a black woman in my basement who needs freedom. If we take care of you, if we cook for you, if we dress your wounds for as long as you're here, will you guarantee her safety? And the officer says, yeah, yeah, I'll do that. That's fine. So what Dave Hankey does is he grabs a, a hammer and some boards, and nails shut the bottom of a Dutch door on the kitchen. And then he looks out the window and he watches as the Confederates tear his farm apart piece by piece. They kill his hogs, they kill his cow, they slice up the bits, they hand them in through the window and he has to cook his own farm animals and then hand them back through the window and feed the Confederates his own livestock. And every time they're doing it, they're literally baking for this woman's life. He knows what this war was fought for. And now in 1870, at the polls in the Cumberland Township polling place, he sees everything that he sacrificed, everything the men who died here sacrificed, being put to question because one guy doesn't want to let black folks vote. So he gets together with Basil Biggs they figure things out, they find a wagon. And Dave Hankey rides up there and he grabs all of the black folks that want to vote, Otho Johnson among them, and crams them onto the wagon and rides it back down. And Otho Johnson says as he was stepping out of the wagon, he reached out for a hand and that hand that caught, caught his and helped him out of the wagon was Basil Biggs. Basil Biggs helps him down from the wagon. He couldn't read. And so Lydia Watts, uh, another black woman who, who can read, goes, here, give me the ballot. And she reads the ballot out loud to Otho Johnston. And he goes, yeah, that's right, that's right, that's who I want. And he goes into the polling place. And he casts that ballot. We lose sight of the, the fact that these human beings exist beyond that tiny little moment of the battle, right? This town has been a battlefield over the question of rights for years. And sometimes you've got white folks that will help black folks on this landscape. And sometimes the landscape looks very different. This photo is exactly what it says on the tin. Um, and you can lean in there. I'll show you a little, a, a couple of, um, a couple of close-ups in a minute, but this is a photograph from 1925, from September of 1925. This is the Pennsylvania State Clan reunion on the Gettysburg battlefield. Again, if we could step inside this photograph and look beyond it, just beyond the ridge that's there in the distance, if you could jump down that ridge, you're on the campus of Pennsylvania College, of Gettysburg College. That tower over on the left-hand side that's one of the observation towers out there on the ridge on your way out to the peace light. You can actually see the, the spires of the monuments there just above the tree line, the monuments that loom all over the campus. The Pennsylvania Klan reunion here in Gettysburg was huge. It's massive. All of these people wearing these hoods, carrying the American flag, carrying these signs, we go to church, do you? come from all over the state of Pennsylvania. You see in the background there, those Model Ts lined up around the, around the, um, the edge of the field. And that was so that at night, they could turn on the lights and light up the field. That wasn't the only light of the in the field. Part of this event was um, a clan initiation. They call them naturalization ceremonies because you're joining the invisible empire, this new nation that you're becoming a citizen of. And like every clan initiation, that means that there were burning crosses on the prominent hillside of Oak Hill. 
right where the peace light is today. And you look down there in the front row, you see it there? You got the, the clan leaders there with their arms crossed like this and the hoods on. And next to them are members of the Grand Army of the Republic veterans of the Civil War who fought for the United States, who fought against slavery, now standing there side by side with the Klan. Unless you think that this is just the Klan coming here and that Gettysburg really didn't believe in this, this is the front page of the Gettysburg Times from September 19th, 1925. Notice that it's the special Ku Klux Klan edition. Notice that headline on the right-hand side. The Ku Klux Klan presents a gorgeous display in monster procession this afternoon. Many unique features are demonstrated. Very colored robes, capes, gowns present, spe present spectacle as knights, clansmen, women, and junior members march under warm September sun. Town turns out by the thousands to greet Klansmen. Applause given unstintingly by crowds on the sidewalk as the marchers pass. The headquarters for this clan, clan reunion, the place that they rented out for their offices was the Hotel Gettysburg. The same Hotel Gettysburg that's here on the square today. That was their headquarters. Look up here in the right-hand corner, or I'm sorry, in the left-hand corner. Good evening, welcome to Gettysburg the heart of the new America, the Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. And it's not just guests. I love that phrase, I got the receipts. Um, there's a cache of documents in Harrisburg with the um, Pennsylvania State Archives. They're actually part of the, the um, state police collection because they were garnered in a raid that was done by the state police. And they are the Ku Klux Klan records of the 1920s. And if you go into those documents, you can find documents like that one on the left-hand side there. Notice it says Gettysburg, PA up at the top, February 23rd, 1924. This is a roster of all of the Klan officers in Gettysburg in the 1920s. The exalted Cyclops up there, Reverend Harry Daniels, he was the head of the Episcopal Church in Gettysburg. As you go through the list of folks that were in the Klan, part of the Klan, members or leaders, you start finding everybody. You start finding licensed battlefield guides, folks that work for the park, local officials, local, local elected officials, local police officers, it's everywhere. There's also these kind of documents too. That's a re literal receipt. I got the receipts, like I said. And that's a receipt for clan robes. For the order of clan robes. You can see there at the top, they ordered two clansmen and terror robes and helmets for $5 a piece. Still more. One of these names on here is Pinkney Hess. You see that there? He's one of the three Hess brothers. The Hesses are infamous rabble rousers in Gettysburg in the 1920s. They were bootleggers. They loved to buy hooch too. Like the drink, like the party, and like the mess with the local black community. Beat in the doors of local folks. In fact, there's one case where the Hess brothers break and enter into a local black, a black family's apartment and start beating up on this black man and his son. And of course, you're gonna fight back. You're gonna throw some punches back, right? The Hess brothers, they're let off with a fine of, uh, you know, 10 or 15 bucks. The folks that they beat up, they're let off with a fine of 500. The judicial system is stacked against everyone in town too. All of these names, every one of these names, town leaders, powerful movers and shakers in Gettysburg. The Klan is here and they're powerful. But that doesn't mean that there's not hope. I wanna tell you the hope of one particular woman, the way she fought back against this kind of power structure. It's 
the 1920s. And there's a playground in town, the Kurtz Playground. Kurtz Playground was down um, behind where Mr. G's ice cream is today. Uh, as you're going down there on Baltimore Street, um, that's the Kurtz Playground. It's all that land back there where the, where the middle school is today. The Kurtz Playground had been given by William B. Kurtz, dedicated to his grandfather, who was someone who lived, lived here in town. Kurtz is a rich guy from Philadelphia. He was giving this, uh, this new park as dedicated to his grandfather, to his memory, but also to the fact that he had visited Gettysburg when he was a child to visit his grandfather and Gettysburg had always shown him such love and such appreciation. But by the twenties, the Kurtz playground has run out of cash. You don't have enough cash to operate and nobody seems to want to take it on. The borough doesn't want it. School district doesn't want it because it's going to be too much money to operate. And Kurtz starts getting angry because he's like, listen, I gave you this park. Don't you want this park? Come on. It's a free park. But really, part of the problem is this right here. That is a picture of the segregated school in Gettysburg in the 1920s. This is the African-American school down um, on the corner of, uh, of High Street and uh, Franklin Street, the Franklin Street, Street School, uh, where, the, where the beer distributor is today, if you drive down that way. You see, separate but equal, it's not equal. It's never been equal, even though we pretend it was. If the borough or if the, um, if the school district wants to take on this park, it's gonna have to be open to everybody or there's gonna have to be separate facilities that are of kind. This is Kurtz being indignant. I do not want to force an unwilling gift on anyone, said Mr. Kurtz in speaking on the subject. You all know my object. If my ideas are wrong, say the word and we can scrap the place and charge it off in the experience account where so many of my plans are buried. And then he said this, I built the playground for the use of the children and grandchildren of my old and dear friends in Gettysburg, believing that in so doing, I was making their lives happier and brighter and fitting them physically for their work. It sounds so true altruistic, doesn't it? So kind, so giving, so loving. I built the playground for the use of the children and grandchildren of my old and dear friends in Gettysburg. Gettysburg's black community knows better. And soon they start asking about this. And that quote is reprinted in the paper again with a slight change. I built the playground for the use of the children and grandchildren of my old and dear white friends in Gettysburg. Notice that the times, the first time they printed that quote, left that out. Believing that in so doing, I was making their lives happier and brighter and fitting them physically for their work. Then the quote continues, the stuff they left out the first time. I am fond of the colored people, have no race feeling against them, but do not believe in their social equality with the white races of our country. In a town like Gettysburg, I am sure that they cannot mix socially and that sooner or later, there would be a clash and unpleasant consequences. This isn't a shock to the black folks who live in Gettysburg. And it's not a shock to Margaret Biggs. The name sound familiar, Biggs? She is Basil Biggs's daughter-in-law. Margaret Biggs, who married into the Biggs family, sees what's going on with this park, starts getting angry. The school district has said, we'll take it on. We'll take that land. Because there's already a playground at that Franklin Street school. Margaret Biggs goes, wait, 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 no. We built that playground. You didn't build that playground. The black community of Gettysburg banded together with some white allies. We built that playground. We scrapped together the cash for it. We call ourselves the hand in hand club. What do you mean you're providing a playground? You're not providing a playground. That's not you providing something for both sides. She writes this in a letter to the newspaper. We were under the impression from the beginning it was for the public, but we as colored people soon found out different. When our children were hunted out 
and compelled to leave the ground for no other reason than that their skins were black. Should the school board accept a playground, the taxpayers would all have a right to go there, regard, irregardless of the color of their skin. Taxation without representation is unconstitutional. Either federal or state law can uphold it. Why don't you set those two things right there next to each other? We know the power structure that existed in Gettysburg. All of those local folks that were in the Klan, the way the Klan was welcomed here in 1925. And then Margaret Biggs, one black woman, writing a letter to the paper, standing up, saying, no, this is wrong. This is wrong. I see it. We see it. You can't do this. Of course, the school board doesn't listen. They give a little bit of cash to the playground for some teeter-totters and some picnic tables to kind of smooth things over. But in the end, they take the land. They take the Kurtz playground. It's the reason the middle school is built there today. In fact, if you go over there, next time you're down there eating ice cream at Mr. G's, you walk over to the, the cages around some of those um, sports fields, you'll find that one of the baseball diamonds is still named Kurtz Field after Kurtz Park, after this segregated facility in Gettysburg's history. Margaret Biggs put it all on the line at that moment, right? It's 1921, 22. Across the South in America, if you look crossways at someone, you could end up at the end of a rope or burned to death at a stake. She puts her life on the line in a very, very racially, well, racist town. That's courage. As time marches on, there's other folks that show that kind of courage too. This is uh, a picture there in the center of Philip Snuffy Parsons. Gettysburg College class of 1964, among that handful of, uh, of first black folks who were um, admitted to Gettysburg College, some of the one or two every single year for about a decade. I don't wanna say token black students, but sure as hell looks like that sometimes. Parsons was um, on the football team loved on campus. He was a member of, uh, of Teak, of, uh, of the fraternity, and people looked up to him. In fact, you see here in 1963, his, his senior year, 63, 64, he was a co-captain of the football team, a black man. Makes Gettysburg feel extremely progressive for 1963. Of course, Gettysburg is a fractured place. The spring of his senior year, uh, there's a special speaker that comes to campus, Reverend Joseph Washington. He was from Dickinson College across the mountain. He's the chaplain up there. He's a black man coming to speak. And the topic of his speech for the Stuckenberg lecture was whether the Negro can be an American in society. Can the Negro be an American was the title. You can see it there on the right-hand side. I love that, that quote right up there at the top. Whether the Negro can be an American depends on whether he can force his way into American society and force the members of the white community to know him. Reverend Washington gave an amazing speech when he was here. He talked about segregation he had seen in the South when he had been visiting there, but also segregation he had seen in the North when he was visiting his own hometown in Wisconsin, the fact that he had been denied access to a hotel. And as Dr. Washington is visiting Gettysburg, as he's wandering through the streets of this town, he'd see the markers of segregation that existed all over America in the windows of our barber shops were signs that said, we do not cut Negro hair. If he had tried to sit down to lunch at the Hotel Gettysburg, 
Well, he would have been served in 1964, but that was a new policy, only three years old. They didn't desegregate the lunchroom there until 1961. And then it took a member of the, a former member of the Hitler Youth to actually do it. He basically said, I've seen hate other places. You're not going to do it here. Bill Parsons, I don't know if he was at this event, but I know he knew about it. Because in this same issue of the Gettys Bertrand, you can find it on the college, the college library's website in the Get Digital Collection. In that same issue, he wrote a letter to the editor. Parsons had been going into the dining hall, which at that point in time was in Huber Hall up on Carlisle Street. And as he was going into the dining hall, he saw a poster for the event. And I don't know if the poster was designed this way or if it had graffiti on top of it. I think it was designed this way. It had a racial slur, the racial slur, the big one, right there in the center. If you look up the copy of the Gettys Virgin, there's a picture of the poster. I wasn't going to put it here. I didn't want to cause that kind of stress for you guys. Because when Phil Parsons sees that, wandering in to get his lunch past the cork board and sees that poster, it stops him dead. One word, six letters. This is what he wrote. I feel that whoever is responsible for marking the sign used very poor taste and it exhibited a lack of good common sense. Obviously, he has no conception as to how a single word can affect a person. He has no idea of the sensitivity and inner feelings of a Negro when such a slur is directed at him or his race. Phil is one of four or five black students on a campus that is lily white. And he has the courage to say this in a letter to the editor. As I walked into the dining hall, that sign was the first thing to catch my eye. For a moment, I stood there in amazement for I could not believe what I saw. I was embarrassed and humiliated, and it seemed that the longer I stared at that sign, the more tense and upset I became. A very odd feeling came over me, one that can't be described, only felt. I could feel the blood rushing in my head as my fists clenched, and momentarily I began to hate. All of this was unconsciously done, as if I had become irrational. I tried to ignore the sign by saying to myself, well, that person certainly showed his ignorance. I even tried to pass it off as a joke, but I knew the damage was done. And it hurt. The word had cut me, and the wound deepened as I stood there. I could feel myself perspiring and began to look around to see who was looking and laughing at me. I had at this time, more than ever, I'm conscious of my color. Phil Parsons knew he was a black man on campus. But it was moments like this that it really stuck out to him. Moments when he realized this was a place that hadn't been built for him. He was an interloper. But he didn't want it to be that way. He wanted it to be a place where he belonged just as much as everybody else. And then things like this happen. I wanted to get away, to hide, but something forced me to stay. I regained my composure and aided by a friend. And stop and think about that for a second. It had to be another white student because there aren't many black folks on campus. Aided by that ally, I removed the poster from the board. Many students sympathized with me but I knew deep down that they could only imagine a fraction of how I felt. Even though the sign was not directed at me, I felt it personally and it burned. Only those who have been subjected to similar rebuffs can understand the hurt and pain associated with such an offense. It is natural for people to become embarrassed and humiliated at times, but this incident affected me deeply. Although the sign, as such, they have seemed harmless, but lessened my sense of personal value and degraded my human dignity. Remember what Dr. Washington said in his speech here? If black folks are going to find a place in America, he said in 1964, here on the campus, 
It means speaking up, saying no. America is my place too. Gettysburg is my place too. And Phil Parsons had to do that in 1964 too, writing his letter to the editor of the Gettysburgian. Letter you can easily find in the Get Digital collection. You can just pull it up anytime that you need it. The strength, the strength that we can draw from him by saying, of course he was right. That poster was wrong. It was a dagger to his heart and that is why we fight. The history of this place is not filled with passive observers. Even the folks that we thought were passive observers weren't. They were active participants. They were folks who were actively resisting power structures. Folks like Margaret Biggs, who stands up against the Klan and against segregation. Folks like um, Basil Biggs, who's helping folks to vote for the very first time in the 1870s. Folks like Edward Hopkins, who's breaking the barriers opening doors for men right beside him. And folks like Phil Parsons, who when he sees something that strikes him to the core, doesn't just laugh it off, but says something, speaks out. So we end right here, right back where we began. This campus, of Pennsylvania College, now Gettysburg College. I want to encourage you, whether you're a student here, whether you're an alumni, whether you're a friend of the college, whether you're faculty, whoever you are, make sure you speak out. When you see it, call it out. Try to make it better. That's what Phil Parsons would want us to do. That's what Margaret Biggs would want us to do. That's what Edward Hopkins would want us to do. That's what Basil Biggs. They're all calling us to make this place a better place, to make our world a better place. Follow the example of the past to make a better future. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of hope. And in the end, history is useless if all we do is study it. Instead, let's let it inspire us to take action in our present and in our future. So thank you guys for letting me share. And I am up for every question under the sun that you've got. I got plenty of time now to, to play with questions. So if you have a question for Don, you can put it in the chat. We have someone monitoring the chat to keep the conversation going. Or if you're comfortable with unmuting yourself, you can join the conversation that way. So we can begin. I just wanted to relate a story. I knew Snuffy pretty well ah. actually, when I was at Gettysburg. But another gentleman who uh, <clears throat> was John Wilkerson. Okay. I don't know if you've not come across his name. I have not, but I, but always I, I was a member years. of the uh, Alpha Chi Rho fraternity. And our house was over at 143 Spring Street. And John was a black from Harrisburg. He was a track star and a perfect gentleman. And uh, we elected him president of Alpha Chi Rho, uh, the first black president of a fraternity. And um, unfortunately, some of the administration of the college, college was quite critical of us of having done that. And um, John was a very influential uh, individual in terms of recruiting other black uh, students to mm -hmm. the fraternity and we had an assortment of them. Um, <clears throat> very proud of the fact that John was there. His parents would come for parents weekend and uh, I look at John and I think of him as one of the early innovators of integrating some philosophy and friendships and personalities. So in your research, you might want to look up John. I think he's now living in Texas. That's awesome. Yeah, um, I'm going to add him to my list of, of folks that I need to, to dig out details on. Unfortunately, we, we lost Phil Parsons a few years ago. Right. So I've never, I never got a chance to meet or talk to Phil. 
but I have talked talk to some of the Teak brothers that um, did that lived with him uh, and and uh, went to school with him, and their stories are fun too. The there's also a story of uh, of um, Snuffy doing a, he, he staged a sit in at Town and Campus Hair uh, because uh, the dean at barber shop wouldn't cut his hair. So, so that's I, I'm adding him to my list. Don, thank you so much. And the story goes, John, and I don't know if it's true, but at the time um, when the student union was built, mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> they integrated a small barbershop yep. up there. And the, the stories that I remember was they had to do that in order to qualify for, for some federal funding. And I never knew if that was a true story, but I don't know if it's because of federal funding, but I do know that there were no black uh, black uh, catering barber shops in Gettysburg at all. Um, so if you were a black man and you had you had to have your hair cut here in town, you went to an off licensed barber in a basement down on um, South Washington Street. Right. Part part of that is also just to say, hey, let's make this place space uh, more accepting to. I don't know if there's federal money tied to it. Um, Incidentally, if you were a woman in town and you wanted to get your hair done, you typically had to go all the way down to Rockville, Maryland um, to find a hairdresser. And so there would actually be caravans that would go down and it was a huge event to have your hair done the first time. Not just because you're getting your hair done the first time, but it's because you can all go all the way to Rockville to get it done. Well, I remember John saying, I'm going home this weekend to Harrisburg. And we would say, well, why are you going home? He says, I got to get my hair cut. Yeah. So I've got a couple of good questions here in the chat. Um, Charles is asking if there's a place in the college where these stories and others are saved to be reviewed. And um, I, I don't know, um, Monique, do, do we have, I know that there's you know bits and pieces here and there, but do we have a central archive like where we could save some of this stuff besides the fact that we're recording? Yes, the institution has been working, and when I say institution, I really mean Muslim Library and I'm reviewing the archive is there, have been working to get um, firsthand primary source stories from um, black and brown alumni throughout history. And so there is an archive where you can go and you can hear stories from Myra T. Heron, which was the um, mm -hmm. first black woman to graduate from Gettysburg. You can hear um, stories, more recent history from Dean Pete Curry. There is a whole archive and constant additions being added um, to the library um, archives of those stories. And Carolyn up there in the college archives is an amazing person who loves sharing these stories too. So if you, if you wanna go up and geek out with Carolyn, she is wonderful. You just go up and be like, hey, I'm interested in this. And she will shower you with new, with new documents too. Uh, had a good question here um, on the the evolution of Gettysburg's Black community from um, from Brandon, and in general, um, the the Black community hasn't grown all that much, but hasn't shrunk all that much from the time of the battle on up. It's been roughly ten to twelve percent of the local population in in the borough of Gettysburg. Uh, in the in the actual um, municipality, not in the county itself, uh, and there have been fluctuations here and there, but um, I don't think that that's that's really driving a reticence in the 1920s to deal with the black community. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure it's it's driving that. It's it's more national trends actually. I think that are driving it. The the rise of the Klan in the 1920s. Um, you know, you've got a national clan that's popping up. So of course you've got a local clan that pops up. Uh, and then it's, uh, there's, there's some moments in the 19 teens where Gettysburg realizes that they can court Southern visitors. Well, if you can court Southern visitors, it means that if you're courting black visitors, those two groups at that moment are oil and water. And so as a result, Gettysburg as a whole kind of says, we'll, will throw the black visitors to the curb so we can get the white Southern visitors here. Now there's those kind of moments are, um, it's, it's more this out exterior politics that's pushing its way in than I think it is the demographics, Brandon. And Kate, I didn't see that episode of Finding Your Roots. So now I have to go find um, Anna Jareeve Smith's uh, episode because that sounds amazing that Basil- Yeah, it, 
it's a great episode and um yeah she's um his great great granddaughter that's so cool yeah now now i gotta go geek out on that thank you <laughs> and thank you janelle for sharing in the chat for those that were also interested in more stories about African-American Gettysburg and um, his name is Devin McKinney um, has been doing the oral histories and there mm -hmm. is a link, well, two links available um, in the chat for those that are interested. Thank you so much, Janelle, for sharing that resource. And because we are recording this, um, once we get the recording transcribed and have um, closed caption, added to it, we will include those links um, and then awesome. send it out again for those that would like to watch it again for prosperity or to share it. Um, we'll send that out to all of those that have registered and participated this evening. We have time for one more comment or question. Um, I, I, I got one here in the chat that was a direct message to me, Monique. Okay. Um, Perfect. It's, the, it's a question of, um, are there any monuments or recognition sites that have been created for people like Edward Hawkins. And um, no, but that doesn't mean that you guys can't. And that's really where, what I wanna under, underscore is that um, monuments can be built, monuments can be taken down, monuments can be changed, and that's all up to you guys to do. Um, it's, it's all of our responsibility to advocate for this thing. And, um, there are folks in town right now that are advocating for monuments to the enslaved people um, that were brought to Pennsylvania during the invasion in 1863 and who were taken away from Pennsylvania in 1863. But if we're starting to look bigger, we're starting to go Edward Hopkins, Margaret Biggs, Basil Biggs, talk about all these folks. Um, there's certainly a lot of work that we can do together to get, their, get these stories out there in the landscape so that they cross pollinate a little bit more. Um, and that's, that's really where you guys come in. <laughs> um, so be advocates for your history and, uh, yeah. and make, we have, one, yep. we have one last comment from Janelle. If you could pick any Gettysburg person to have a monument about, who would it be? That's a really tough question for him, Janelle. Yeah, it, it is. Um, I mean, Ed Hopkins is really close to my heart. Um, Phil Parsons is really close to my heart. Both both of them are just amazing, amazing people. You know, both ends of the spectrum there too, chronologically. Um, it's hard though, with with so many people at play, and so many amazing lives. You know, there's there's one person that isn't recognized that I think deserves recognition, and his name is E. Washington Rhodes, who was the president of the Black Newspaper Editors Caucus in 1963. And at the centennial, the 100th anniversary of Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, he gave a speech and basically underlined in that crucial year of 1963, everything that was on the line. And he said, the dream that Lincoln had here has still not been fulfilled. And he had the courage to do that at that, that, at that moment. And if I could have any monument, if I could go you know, wave a magic wand and it's up tomorrow, putting a copy of his speech on a piece of bronze in the National Cemetery is right there. That's it, is basically go. See Lincoln in, in 1863? Yeah, 1963, it wasn't fulfilled. And 2021, it probably still hasn't quite been fulfilled yet either. So there's, there's a, there's a way, wand waving answer for you, Janelle. So again, I wanna thank everyone for joining us this evening, John. Thank you, thank you, thank you again yes. um, for your insight and giving I despise the term, but I think it's very necessary in this moment, giving voice to power to those that um, have gone forgotten. So thank you, everyone have a good evening um, and stay safe, mask up.